everyone. Um, good to see everyone here again bright and early. My name is Arpita Upadhyay from the University of Maryland, and I'll be chairing the session. Today's first session is Molecular Mechanisms and Interactions. Um, so for the timing for the 15-minute talks, I will stand up two minutes before the final 15 minutes. Um, so you should be getting ready you know, for questions. And for the five-minute talks, I'll stand up one minute before uh, it ends. Um, and we'll try to keep on time. Uh, happy to have our first speaker today, uh, Greta Grassman. Hi, good morning to everyone. Can you all hear me even in the last rows? OK, great. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks to the organizer for giving me the opportunity of being here. And of course, thank you all for arriving in time because I was super afraid of having to talk to an empty room. So thank you. Today, I will present uh, another computational protocol that we are developing to predict uh, pairs of interacting residues at the core of protein interfaces. For those of you not in the field, uh, predicting and understanding protein interactions is fundamental because over 80% of protein um, work in complexes, which are uh, central to most physiological and pathological cell processes. For example, many neurodegenerative diseases are associated to protein aggregation, so many research lines are trying to propose small molecules that can inhibit disaggregation by inserting themselves at the binding site between these proteins. All these interactions happen in the cell, which is crowded with uh, molecules and many other components. So binding partners have to find themselves in this environment and bind with high specificity. So protein interfaces are known to display a set of compatibilities. Some of these uh, features, like the shape complementarity at the interfaces or their preferentially hydrophobic compositions are well known and already implemented in computational methods for the prediction of interactions. Other features are still being investigated to better understand how they could be added to these protocols to improve the characterization of the binding sites, because these will allow us to discriminate between random and interacting sites uh, with more ease. However, adding features also increases the computational cost, which is already very high because of a set of possible contact between patches and of their possible relative orientation. So to understand the molecular mechanisms driving protein interaction and predict their binding, we have to identify the interfaces in reasonable computational times by determining the most efficient parameters to do this. To face these two challenges, we are developing this computational method based on the Zernike two-dimensional polynomial expansion to evaluate the complementarity of as many features as possible. Among uh, these features, Van der Waals interactions are known to play a central role in, play in protein interactions by determining the shape complementarity at the interfaces through the rearrangement of the interacting residues side chains. So we started to apply this protocol to the evaluation of this kind of complementarity. We start uh, by selecting uh, oh, this is nice by selecting a portion or patch of a molecular surface and projecting it onto a disk by building a two-dimensional matrix in which each pixel is associated to the spatial position of the points projected inside of that pixel. This is a two-dimensional function that we can expand on the basis of the Zernike polynomials. So at the end of this process, we associate each patch with a Zernike vector describing its shape. The level of details of this description depends on the order of expansion n. Too low values result in a too smooth reconstruction, while too high n give us unnecessary and time-consuming details. These uh, Zernike vectors do not depend on the orientation of the patches because they are invariant under rotation. And this allows for a super quick comparison between all the possible patches between uh, two proteins. Uh, which is uh, really important during the blind search for interfaces. By evaluating the Euclidean distance between the Zernike vectors of all the possible patches pairings, we can identify the regions showing the highest shape complementarity, corresponding to the smallest Euclidean distances. And these regions uh, should be the one uh, interacting. 
Um, this protocol could be, in principle, applied to any feature that can be described by assigning some numerical values to the surface point. Since uh, electrostatic is also really important for protein interaction, even if its role is a bit more debated, we started to expand this protocol to the evaluation of electrostatic uh, complementarity. Let's call it like this. The protocol is the same as for the shape complementarity evaluation, only that in this case we start from the electrostatic potential surface that we build by assigning to each surface point the value of electrostatic potential computed in that point with the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So then we can take a portion of this new surface and project it to obtain two matrices. The one I was telling you before with a shape projection and uh, one matrix in which each pixel is associated with the electrostatic potential values of the points projected inside of that pixel. And as before, we can uh, describe this uh, matrix with a Zernike vector. And again, small Euclidean distances between vectors correspond to a high complementarity. By evaluating the shape complementarity, we are able to discriminate between binding and random patches with an area under the receiving operating characteristic curve of 0.7. That is, we can uh, divide uh, with a uh, good accuracy the distribution of the random and uh, interacting patches. With electrostatic complementarity evaluation, we can instead discriminate between transient and permanent interactions with an area under the curve of 0.8. So we tested these two um, protocols on some system models. And then we started working on merging these uh, features evaluation with a super simple neural network uh, that should be able to identify pairs of interacting residues that are at the core of the uh, interfaces. We started by characterizing the experimental binding site from a data set of 4,000 of complexes, more or less, to provide a quantitative characterization of the size of the protein surface regions in which these uh, features are maximized. So you can see on the box plot on the bottom the, the distributions of the Euclidean distances between the Zernike vectors of patches facing each other at increasing distance from the center of the interfaces. And you can observe that up to a distance of 10 Armstrong, more or less, this complementarity is higher than that between random patches, which is shown by the red dotted line. The same area is uh, where also the hydropa hydropathy complementarity is maximized. In this, ca in this case, the complementarity was defined starting from the product between the hydropathy index of the residues, as defined by a scale that was proposed recently by my group. Then we started working on uh, um, deciding how to give this data to the neural network. For each pair of proteins, we compute the shape, electrostatic, and hydropathy complementarity between all the possible residues pairings. For the second protein, protein B, we also compute the distances between all of its residues. And this fourth matrix is used to identify for each residue on the second protein the first nine neighbors. This number was chosen because it allows us to cover an area with a 10 Armstrong radius, which is the one in which the features I am presenting you are maximized. So we can um, assign to each pair of residues, like residue 1A and 1B, a, a matrix with four columns and 10 rows. In the first row, we have the complementarity between residue 1A and 1B, and in the last column, the distance uh, uh, between 1B and itself, so of course zero. In the second row, we have again the complementarity between residue 1A and the first neighbor of residues 1B, that we call 2B and the distance between residue 1B and 2B. In the third row, the same thing, but for the second neighbor of 1B. We then give this uh, simple matrix as input to this uh, um, embarrassingly simple neural network that assign to each pair of residues a, a numerical value, which reflects uh, the probability of this pair of being a pair of interacting residues at the core of the interfaces. In this case, we are define, defining real interacting residues as those that are closer than three Armstrong to each other and at a distance smaller than five Armstrong from the center of the interfaces. When a 
applied on a balanced data set, this uh, neural network reached an accuracy of 78 in uh, identifying these uh, interacting residues. And uh, as expected, most of these, radius, these residues were hydrophobic. However, as you can see in the bar plot on the right, uh, the, the network does not seem to be unbalanced toward this class, which is hopefully good. So the question is now, can we really identify interacting residues? And the answer is, nah. We, on a, on a data set of 100 proteins, we performed a blind search for interacting pairs. So in this case, we do not have a balanced data set. And we reached an accuracy of 82. And you can see here the distribution of the neural network prediction for interacting and non-interacting pairs. And we were able to discriminate between them with an area under the curve of 0 0.72. However, this um, performance could be improved by taking in, uh, into account the chemical features of the residues that we are looking at. Because as you can see in the table, the R under the curve changes when stratifying the data set. And this is one of the things that I will be doing this evening because I didn't have the time yesterday. Another um, future step that we have to take is of course comparing our results with uh, some state-of-the-art docking methods to understand if by um, evaluating a shape, uh, electrostatic and hydrophobic, hydro hydropathy complementarity with this neural network, we are able to reinforce uh, docking or pose selection algorithms. And these were our super latest results. Before leaving you, I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to do some shameless uh, self-promotion. We recently started the Young European Biophysical Societies Association, never going to pronounce this again, the Young EPSA, which starts from the EPSA, which is an association that was, was founded in 1984. They organize meetings, workshops, school, offer grants and bursaries, and they also uh, organize a congress every two years. The, first, the, second, the next one will be next June in Rome, if you want to join us. Young EPSA was founded like two weeks ago, and we share similar, a similar objective, which is defunding biophysics in Europe, but we want to focus on young researchers. So the main objective, objective is building a network among young PhD and postdocs to help people in building uh, collaborations and also share their work. So if you are interested or if you want to help me out, you can follow us on social media. And on each of these profiles, you will also find our official email. So I would... Uh, uh, kindly, I invite you to send us a suggestion on maybe if you did some work you are proud of, we, we can share on these uh, accounts. <coughs> Last uh, self-promotion. There will be um, the first Disva Mesbic Symposium in Ancona this year in September, which is another small conference centered on the computational and experimental studies of protein interaction. So if you are interested, please go to the QR code. Going back to the presentation, I would like to thank all the members of my group, the biomodeling group in Rome, and of course, thank you all for your attention. Questions? Yeah, th thank you for the question. We simply associated to each residue the, let's say, the average position of all the atoms uh, composing it. Yeah, so it's a bit of approximation, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There are a lot of approximation in this work, but the aim is also being as fast as possible. Another question? Well, in that case, thanks for a great talk. <laughs> well, sorry, I'll try to find that. Um, how, how does it work with um, increasing this into a presentation mode? Yeah.
Our next speaker is Nils Ol Walliser. Hi. So adsorption of chemical species onto substrate of uh, a finite size are commonplace in cell biology. Um, minimalist statistical physics account of this situation is a lattice with L uh, um, sites in contact with a reservoir of uh, particles described by a chemical potential mu, where bound particles can interact over short distances mediated by a coupling J. So the energy of the systems depend on the specific configuration of the lattice. And uh, we suppose here that our stochastic variable of interest is the um, relative occupancy of the lattice, which we also, uh, which we also uh, imagine to be experimentable, uh, experimentable accessible. Uh, my motivation here is to give you uh, insights into leveraging uh, the statistical analysis of fluctuation of the lattice occupancy in order to extract key model parameters like the binding energy and the interaction potential. So a nice way to describe, to study fluctuation is to compare the standard deviation against the mean average occupancy. Here we take a system with L equals 13, yeah, and periodic boundary condition. Each of this line represents an integer value of J that spans from minus 10 to 10, from bottom to up. And each of this line, for each of this line, we keep J fixed and we span all possible average value of the lattice occupancy by varying mu. So as you see, the standard deviation, the fluctuations increase uh, with uh, um, J until all these lines collapse into one length with a clear, clear maximum at half filling of 50% relative standard deviation. So here down below the, zero, uh, the J zero line, which is the Hill and Weir case, you see a, a clear regime of anti-cooperativity with the signature of the multiple minima. So if you were to uh, search for an optimal estimation of J, you would like to be in a, a region where this line are maximally spaced. Now, Yesterday, Katerina gave us a great account of the BMF uh, torque production and estimation. Let me just remind you that by tracking the center of mass of a micro-sized bead attached to a BFM, our Montpellier-based fantastic collaborator, Ashley Nott and Francesco Petacci, are capable to create uh, traces like this, where you see the angular velocity of the BFM over time. Now, you notice these jumps here, this continuous uh, increase of, uh, of uh, the angular velocity. They correspond uh, to a docking and undocking of stator units onto the rotor. If you want now to model the system as an absorption model, you may think the rotor here in green as a substrate of finite size with periodic boundary condition onto which up to 13 stator units can attach at equally spaced positions. So, here, our working hypothesis in line with previous studies is that as long as we focus on stator occupancy in the stationary state, this quantity fluctuates around a fixed mean value as if the stator subsystem were effectively at equilibrium. So here are some results. Each of these dots represent a different applied load on the PFM, and it's the result of a statistic of uh, experimental traces over minutes, and it's the mean, or it's a statistic of a tens of traces. So as you see here, the dotted line represents a nonlinear fit to the experimental data, and the best fit value seems to indicate that a moderate level of cooperativity is compatible with the experimental results. So the take home message here is twofold. First, the general theoretical one. When it comes to absorption model, size is key. Cooperativity plus finite size of effects affect the amplitude and the shape of the fluctuation of the substrate occupancy. By leveraging the signature, it is possible to check whether a system is cooperative or anti-cooperative or no cooperative, and eventually also estimate the like and like interaction potential. When it comes to the application to the BFM, a moderate level of cooperativity is consistent with experimental observation. I did not have time to speak about this, but it looks like that this moderate level of, co of, of um, cooperativity is also in line with a good compromise on the trade-off of the system between adaptability and the need to contain amplitude of the fluctuation. Thank you very much for your attention, and I pay to take uh, your questions.
question two? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, of course. Technically, you can go beyond the first moment. You can. Yeah. So let's say it depends what is uh, experimentally accessible. For example, Thomas Alfonsi, uh, my master students and future PhD student, is uh, looking at the statistic of the clustering of uh, units onto the lattice, and you can extract, for example, their uh, relation between uh, the uh, domain walls distribution or the mean domain walls and uh, the average occupancy. And as, as soon as you have access to a new observable, of course, you can start to, to make relation between uh, the different mean values and the uh, relative uh, standard deviations. Yeah, of course. There is a poster by, by this guy in the, the corridor. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Let's sign you. You're welcome. Do you see it? Okay, great. Great. Um, our next talk will be by Maya Lebanon. Good morning, everyone. I'm um, excited to be here today to tell you about some of my work on uh, oscillatory dynamics in an elastic active material. Um, so mechanical oscillations play a variety of roles in biological systems. A few examples include, of course, the beating heart, which acts as a pump, um, the beating of the flagella of sperm cells, which provide cells with motility, and the oscillations in the mitotic spindle, uh, which is a structure that forms during cell division. Uh, it's made of microtubules and molecular motors, and it acts to pull on both ends of the chromosomes in order to split them. Uh, in this case, the oscillations play the role of proofreading the forces applied on the chromosomes. So we were inspired by this variety of phenomena to recreate and study mechanical oscillations in a minimal biological system in the lab. And when we first tackled this challenge, we asked ourselves, what do all of these systems have in common? And we realized that in all of these systems, we see a combination of mechanical forces and resistance to deformation. So as a first step, we wanted to address the need for um, intrinsic mechanical forces. And our solution was to use microtubule-based active matter. Um, generally, active matter is, based on, uh, is made of uh, building blocks that consume energy and generate uh, mechanical forces. As I said, our active matter is based on microtubules, which are these red filaments. And in our case, the uh, forces are applied by a molecular motor protein called kinesin that performs a stepping motion on the filaments. Now, we actually use clusters of these proteins, so once we mix them with the microtubules, the filaments are cross-linked, and they form large bundles made of many uh, filaments. Uh, as the motors slide along the... Okay. As the uh, motors slide along the filaments, they generate a shearing force that acts to reshape the bundles and generate local flows. And this is what it looks like. So here you see the flows of the microtubule bundles. And we can perform velocity analysis on this video. So for example, we can look at the mean velocity in this area throughout the time of the experiment. And when we do that, we don't really recognize any kind of temporal pattern in the dynamics which leads us to the next step, which was to also introduce resistance to deformation. Um, our approach was to add an entangled polymer network that will act as a viscoelastic medium for the active matter. Uh, specifically, we chose to work with uh, uh, long fragments of linear DNA as our network. And this is what happens when we add it to the active matter. Um, so there are two main differences between this video and the previous one. One difference that I hope you can already see is that we now get collective motion, unlike the local flows we saw earlier. And another difference is exposed when we perform the same kind of analysis, and now we see a very clear pattern of oscillatory dynamics. So just to recap, uh, we started with a system that generates stochastic active forces and doesn't show any kind of temporal pattern in its behavior. Uh, we added one component, which was the DNA, 
And that allowed us to introduce long range resistance in the system and obtain uh, an oscillatory pattern in the dynamics and also collective motion which tells us that the addition of only one passive building block uh, was enough to provoke entirely new behavior in the system. Um, so unfortunately, this is all the time I have, but if you want to learn more about what we do with this system, um, please contact me, um, and I thank you for listening. Questions? Um, so, I actually didn't measure it yet, because it's very, still very preliminary. Um, and the, the challenge is that we have many uh, molecular motors sliding on the same filament and also reshaping bundles made of many of them. So I still need to, uh, to put in an essay, we think of maybe adding an essay that's based on a DNA, um, like FRET with DNA, um, but didn't do it yet. So. Uh, yes, thank you, definitely. Uh, when we add less DNA, we don't see this phenomenon. And also, when we add shorter DNA, also same thing doesn't happen. Uh, also, the structure of the DNA. So when we try to add chromosomes, for example, uh, it was probably um, supercoiled and it didn't work. And how about concentration? How much do you have to add to start to see the effect? So it, in... So it's going to be nanograms of the molecules that we use, but I still need to quantify their length, so I'm not sure exactly. Uh, no, not nanograms, I'm sorry, nanomolars. Yeah, so a, f a few dozens of nanograms, probably. Great, thanks a lot for Thank you. Yep, that's good. Okay. How do I go on here? Okay. Yeah, so um, first of all, hello everybody. I come from the, uh, I'm a researcher at Terra Science Park in a very recently founded group. So I take a few seconds to advertise it because I think this is important. So we have a laboratory of genomics and epigenomics in which they have facilities, facilities to sequence DNA and a large data science group with an associated data center. And uh, here we do several activities, but the main focus that, um, let's say in, that we have in common is to study deep learning models uh, in the, let's say, with the perspective of interpretability. So we actually study a lot uh, internal representation of, these, of deep learning models. And what I'm presenting now, it's a little bit uh, a bridge between the two because I'm using um, protein language models, so large language models that occur in text for protein sequences. So the question that we ask is, can we predict the change in thermodynamic stability that occur due to a single mutation in a protein? So just a single amino acid mutation. So in other words, uh, in uh, free energy terms, uh, this uh, is the um, variation in free energy that uh, you have between the difference in the unfolded and folded uh, states of a protein that can occur due to a mutation. So a mutation can be stabilizing, destabilizing, or, or neutral. And um, what uh, we want to leverage is really to take advantage of a new opportunities that this uh, protein language models can give us producing these really highly reaching content uh, representations, and uh, a recently released mega scale uh, data set, which actually motivated us a lot because machine learning methods to face this problem really suffer from the low amount of experimental data. And um, actually, this is kind of shown after 2022 when uh, an ad hoc test set was uh, created that was created exactly to avoid overlap uh, in uh, sequence similarity between this test set and existing training sets. And when this uh, came along, 
then uh, all the methods uh, experience a very drastic drop in performance. So we really care about this issue, we care about the data that we use, and we are careful in what uh, we um, do. So what we actually uh, retain are sequences that don't have actually a high signal of uh, similar similarity or effective overlap when aligned to the test set under consideration with this S669. So um, after this data filtering, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the model that we use. Actually, we compare a lot of models. This is the winning one. And uh, this is a um, particular type of protein language model that is capable to parse uh, multiple sequence alignment uh, of homologous sequences. And um, I really, I mean, what is uh, going on in uh, here is really interesting, but I really don't have time to explain it. So let's say this produces um, high, um, some, some uh, really informative um, embeddings of the sequences that uh, live in a high dimensional space and we combine them in a particular way to input, uh, to feed a multi -layer, simple multilayer perceptron that is informed with the experimental delta delta G values that we got. So then we do a fine tuning. So we actually, um, during back propagation, we go back to the protein language model to change the weights uh, of the model itself. And uh, what we get uh, is really nice. I mean, the, on top you see our model performances in terms of Pearson mean uh, absolute uh, error and the usual metric that uh, are um, adopted in this context. And you see the other models. These are a bunch of uh, machine learning based or also classical physical based models. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we really go above, um, we surpass state of the art. Fortunately, but uh, you see what I was telling you before, that in general performances are really poor on this uh, um, task. So then we perform a, a protein-wise analysis of our results on, on this test set. In particular, here you see proteins with more than, uh, in test set with more than 20 mutations. And uh, there is a protein dependency on the results. I really don't think I have too much time to explain this, uh, so maybe I forgot to say that uh, this work is in press, so you can find it also on the archive, on the bio archive. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thanks to the collaborators, and thank you. Let's say that that's a different approach, no? But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also a big fan of DCA, and actually that's why I was uh, trying this particular model that uses multiple sequence alignment. Uh, we, here we really care about, uh, and also that's why I talked about the data and the data curation that we do, because we are interested in how much this uh, model can really generalize across proteins. And this is a, a big issue, actually. So, yeah, I, I see also this protein dependence. Well, generalized, have to remember that information on the bullet base is very, very important. Different families have very different on the bullet base. That's what makes it difficult. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Another thing that makes it difficult is the experiments are not in this book. Yes, <laughs> there are very few points yeah, in the data set. The different experiments that are R squared. Yeah, and now they change. What I'm using is like a, diff, a new experimental essays actually that came out uh, this summer. So there is also a problem of uniformity of the techniques and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue. And actually this mega scale data set, it's mega, it has a hundred thousands of mutations related to a hundred proteins. So actually in terms of protein variabilities, we still uh, have a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks for the discussion. In the interest of time, we'll move on and thank the speaker again. hear me fine? Awesome. So hello everyone, my name is Luana Zam and I'm a third year graduate student in the Salada Lab at Emory University and today I'd like to show you what we do in our lab for tuning the performance of DNA motors for single molecule nuclear accuracy sensing and uh, the whole motivation of this field of research comes from a, a place of wanting to understand life and as a research farmer once said, what I cannot create I do not understand so we're trying to understand the principles of life by building it. And uh, one ubiquitous phenomenon in nature is the transformation of chemical energy into mechanical work. And let me give you some examples. The common influenza virus uses whole capsid as a motorized rolling machine. Its surface, let's see, okay, here. Its surface is covered with two types of spike proteins. Neuraminidase, hemagglutinin. Hemagglutinin can bind to the sialic acid receptors on the cell surface, whereas neuraminidase binds but also degrades the same sialic acid residues. And this is how the influenza virus can roll on a cell surface until it finds a suitable entry point into the host for infection. Another exemplary system uh, is given by the cytoskeletal motor proteins that were already introduced today in this session, such as dynein, kinesin. They transport very important cargoes, such as organelles, large RNA, protein complexes inside the cell for cytokinesis, chromosome movements, so they're all, all functions that are essential to life. And this animation here gives us a really good idea of how they move inside the cell along the microtubal filaments to move the cargo, in this case, a vesicle. And we also know that this motion is powered by chemical energy in the form of ATP molecules, which means that they operate, so the, these natural molecular machines operate <laughs> under conditions that are far from equilibrium. So if you want to create synthetic motors, we need to follow the same rule. And the models that are made of DNA are among the most promising because we can literally um, exploit the predict predictability of watson Greek franklin based pairing rules. And uh, one of the first successful synthetic models is this um, bipedal DNA worker that it essentially utilizes connecting strands to hold each foot to the track. And then they introduce a few strands uh, to remove the connected strand, so now the, the foot is free to move to the next position. Uh, DNA workers can also be engineered with embedded computation. So here we have a very uh, fascinating example of a single-stranded DNA robot that can pick up two types of molecular packages and then drop them off at their respective destinations. And uh, another class of DNA machines that can generate useful work uh, these DNA rotary models. Here we have two examples created by the Simon lab and the Dietz lab that can be um, controlled remotely by applying an external electric field. And so these are all very impressive DNA architectures, but they all come with their own limitations, including the fact that DNA workers are very slow. Each step might take over five minutes, and uh, they have very few attachments to the track. So there is this well-documented trade-off between speed and processivity, meaning that if we try to increase the velocity, the model can very easily then dissociate from the track. And uh, in the case of DNA rotors, they obviously are quite static. They're not capable of translocation. So they, are, they would not be the best choice. We want to cover um, longer distances. So to address these limitations, um, the Salada lab works with a different paradigm. Our model uh, has a spherical, rigid chassis, coordinates the movement of thousands of DNA legs that can bind to the complementary RNA that we have on a surface. Then we introduce an enzyme, let me see if I can point it out here. Then we have an enzyme RNAsH that only cleaves the hybridized RNA. So this allows the model to dissociate on one end and then it can bind to new, fewer strands and move forward. And um, this RNA fuel is labeled with a Psi3 fluorophore so that we can monitor uh, the fuel consumption in real time. Here, as a matter of fact, we have, you see the model, oh, here you are, 
co-localized with a depletion track, and then our single particle algorithm can recreate the trajectory with very high precision. And we also know that this, our models can generate active motion because when we calculate the diffusion coefficient alpha value that comes from the uh, power law dependence or mean square displacement against lag time, we obtain alpha values that are above one. So it, this falls in the regime of super diffusing motion. Uh, if the alpha value was equal to one, then we, have, we will have random Brownian diffusion, and below one will be sub-diffusing motion, which is not our case. And we also have created variants of this construct with optimal presenting surfaces, and this system can then be used for the detection of targets, for example, of um, viral particles, including SARS-CoV-2. And in this system, the binding event to the virus, uh, which is a chemical information, is transduced into a stalling event mediated by the DNA models, which is a uh, mechanical information. So then next, we wonder if we could use our DNA models as a mechano-sensing platform also for the ultra-sensitive detection of nucleic acids. So for this project, I wanted to see if we can manipulate the model speed and the processivity by tuning the affinity between the DNA legs and the RNA fuel. So essentially, we rationally uh, changed the sequence. And once we found the best performing sequence, we tested the uh, sensitivity and the specificity of our mechanosensing assay to model DNA analytes. And so toward the, the first goal, so again, we wanted to change the affinity between DNA legs and the RNA fuel. And um, so to do, this, to do so, we studied the impact of the GC content on the stability of the duplex and the dissociation rate. We generated a small library of, uh, with three model designs uh, with 0, 33, and 100% GC content. And uh, as we expected, we found that these three types of models perform very differently. After the same amount of time, typically 30 minutes, we found that the um, depletion tracks that they generated showed a drastic difference in length. The uh, trajectories of the models that have a 0% GC also uh, grow much more, so they travel much farther from the initial position compared with the other two systems. We took uh, one representative trajectory from each of these designs and then we color coded based on instantaneous velocity. And we, again, it is very clear that the model with 0% GC can travel uh, greater speeds and consume the chemical fuel at a much faster rate than the other two systems. Then uh, we wanted to be sure that this behavior is not limited to individual models, to single models, so we look at the ensembles. And the uh, net displacements of the ensembles uh, is significantly different across the three populations. And the frequency distributions, the model velocity, also shows a huge jump from 30%, 33% GC to 0% GC. And in light of this observation, then we decided to relabel our 0% GC model as turbocharged models. And our turbocharged models are special because um, when we monitor the instantaneous velocity over time of the individual models, we uh, we observe the fact that they can reach instantaneous velocity of around 100 to 150 nanometer per second, which is impressive because it means that they cl can closely approach the mechanical properties of the biological model proteins. Um, next was that we wonder, can turbocharged models act as mechanosensor, uh, so detect DNA targets with um, high sensitivity, high specificity while they are moving? And our past modeling, uh, According to our past modeling, low first generation, oh, let me see. Okay, low first generation coupled with high speed is the ideal combination for DNA models to, um, to be good mechanosensors. So to test this hypothesis, um, the approach that we used was to replace a control ratio of the RNA fuel on a surface with the analog DNA strand to form double-stranded DNA, tethers with the DNA, DNA legs, that could not be hydrolyzed by the enzyme, so it, it would be RNSH insensitive, and they would generate um, tunable resistance against stress location. And if our hypo hypothesis is correct, then this binding event should translate into full or transient stalling. So then we challenge the, our turbocharging models 
uh, with an increasing ratio of surface DNA probes, which now serve as the target of interest. And we can see that um, the trajectories of the models become shorter and shorter as we increase the density of the target molecules. And we can also see um, very good stalling efficiency uh, with a significant difference in uh, net displacement from the control down to a probe density of only 0.5 strands per micron square, which was not observed with the other sequences. The alpha values of the um, ensembles also decreases as we increase the probe density. And this is most likely because um, of the physical constraints that are applied to motion. And again, the, the models are progressively decelerated over time. And this, again, this, corroborating, this corroborates the idea of the models being stalled by uh, binding the target molecules. And the, um, there is a significant increase in the percentage of stalled models, again, also at the lowest probe density. And this might reflect the ability of turbocharged models to generate a discernible mechanical response to single target molecules. And because there is a really low chance of encountering a target molecule, this probe density, we believe our mechanosensing assay to have single molecule sensitivity. And uh, to have a visual confirmation that we are effectively changing the di distribution and density of the target molecules on the surface, we used um, spherical nucleic acids. So these are gold nanoparticles that are functionalized with a complementary DNA. They're also fluorescent label, so they can act as a signal amplifier. We incubated them on the surface um, with different like, uh, densities of, of the probe, and then we collected these images. And we found that the, as we increase the target density, uh, there is an increase in the average intensity of fluorescence or and or in pixel count. So then to account also for the, bleed, uh, the fluorescent bleed through of each particle across the neighboring pixels, we used uh, the integrated, so the area under the curve uh, for assess intensity, to uh, provide clear evidence of the increase in trend uh, in the target density. And we were especially interested in confirming the distribution density at the lowest probe density because at 0.5 uh, uh, probes per micron square, this is where the sparsity of the target molecules ensures a maximum on one tether to the models at any given time. And then finally, uh, we also wanted to determine the specificity of the mechanical readout for our mechanosensing assay. So we introduced um, one nucleotide and two nucleotide mutations in the target. And uh, uh, we then we did also some, some new pack analysis and uh, the predicted melting temperatures and also the delta G hybridization both suggest that the presence of even a single mismatch can significantly reduce the stability of the duplex, and indeed, uh, our mechanosensing assay confirms the same prediction. We you can see that the mechanical readout in terms of net displacement is deteriorated by the presence of the mismatches. Um, the percentage of storm models is cut by half uh, in the presence of one mismatch, and the condition with two mismatches cannot be distinguished significantly from the condition without the target. So with that, we can, uh, I, I hope I convinced you that the, we were able to program the DNA models to function as mechanosensors. We can transduce chemical information into mechanical outputs. They are very easy to detect. This chemical to mechanical transduction can be ameliorated if we lower the GC content. And this mechanical readout is uh, very sensitive, has single molecule sensitivity and single nucleotide specificity to the DNA targets. And in the future, potential future work could involve re-engineering the models to also detect different types of targets, complex, maybe hopefully also in complex matrices one day. And we can uh, easily integrate other types of molecular recognition elements, so even antibodies, optimers, synthetic receptors, and nothing stops us also from multiplexing the detection of uh, different biomarkers at the same time. And with that, I would like to thank my supervisor and the rest of my lab for creating a very positive and stimulating work environment. And I want to thank you also for your attention.
Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So we wanted to uh, sort of mimic a lifelike behavior, so what we see with the, for example, with the cytoskeletal model proteins. And essentially, all of them are powered by a chemical, form of chemical energy. In spe the specific case of our role in DNA models, um, we, when we introduce the enzyme, the enzyme creates a chemical gradient. So the model is biased to move to the into the areas where it finds more fuel than less fuel. So when it degrades, it, it's propelled to move away from the consumed substrate. So, so this is not a tuna boat uh, riding it's actually burning down until you reach a equilibrium. It's out of equilibrium. It's definitely out of equilibrium. Yes, you're right, yeah. It could be tuna, I guess. It's like if we can, we, we probably can change the enzyme concentration or like we, I don't know, mutate the, the enzyme. So it really enzyme dependent uh, and the, it depends on the activity of the enzyme. You're absolutely correct in the sense that once we set on a specific enzyme, then like the whole motion is dictated by the, the, the choice or the selection of the enzyme. Yeah, of course. <laughs> The sequence, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're, the, yeah, everything. The, I'm sure, like we, we found that. So because the motion of the motor is um, controlled by three rates: the rate of binding, the rate of cleavage of the enzyme, as we mentioned, and the rate of dissociation. What we have really control of is the rate of dissociation by changing the sequence. So that's that's what the GC content is doing: is that changing the stability. So then by by uh, modulating the number of hydrogen binding. And we could do it also if we change the length of the sequence as well. Instead of, in, in our case, all the information I'm showing here is based on duplexes that are uh, 15 nucleobases. We try also uh, 12, 9, and 18, and we found that the 15 one was um, best performing. Oh, I see. We have not considered that. That would be. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And let's thank our speaker again. Speaker is uh, Giuliano Migliorini. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Giuliano Migliorini. I am a second year PhD student in physics at the University of Orléans in France and at the University of Florence in Italy, of course. Uh, and today, I'd like to tell you about diffusion and enzymatic reactions in crowded environments, um, which is the main part of my uh, PhD that is part of a project called X-Crowd that aims at shedding light on how crowding affects enzymatic activity in the extracellular matrix. So first of all, what is the extracellular matrix? The extracellular matrix is the non-cellular component that makes up all of our tissues and organs. It is uh, very important for the health of organisms and it is therefore continuously remodeled, mainly by enzymatic activity. And it is densely populated by diverse micromolecular structures. And the presence of these macromolecular structures at high density uh, make of it a crowded environment. Therefore, it is an environment that is affected by this effect, macromolecular crowding, that is present in most of uh, living, uh, I mean, also in cells. And uh, it is not that like a single species is necessarily at a high density in the system, but the overall density of macromolecules proteins uh, is typically very high. And therefore, this leads to several effects. Uh, excluded volume effects, weak interactions, increased viscosity, hydration effects, and all, all of these uh, lead to uh, changes comparing what happens in dilute conditions, which is what typically is done 
in experiments and what happens in, uh, in, in the extracellular matrix and the, in cells. Therefore, this is the question that XCrowd wants to uh, uh, face. How does CRUD affect the enzymatic activity in the extracellular matrix? So this is the experimental plan of XCrowd. Some uh, enzymes were chosen here. I show you human neutrophil elastase, that is a characteristic uh, ACM enzyme that is involved in the degradation of elastine, especially damaged elastine. And so the main actors of our uh, experiments are, of course, uh, enzymes, natural substrates, but also we use small substrate mimics, which I'm going to focus mostly in this talk. And the idea is to perform experiments, starting from enzymatic kinetics, uh, varying crowding concentration. Uh, mostly we focused on the use of dextran, that is a polysaccharide, uh, in three different sizes. And typically we reach concentration around 20% in weight fraction. And so uh, I will focus in the following mainly on uh, fluorescence uh, measurements, uh, which uh, allow us to follow enzymatic kinetics with this, two, uh, with this enzyme that you see here and this substrate. It is a, a short peptide with a uh, fluorescent uh, end so that after cleavage the fluorescent end is released and one can follow uh, its, uh, its production. But also other experiments are performed, for example, through nuclear magnetic resonance, we can follow the diffusion of this uh, small substrate. So that the idea is to characterize uh, uh, in a complete picture the environment uh, of the reaction. By the way, in the following, I'm going to focus on this uh, uh, experiment of enzymatic kinetic through fluorescence intensity measurement, as I mean a spectrophotometric uh, approach. Uh, the idea is that so the, the substrate after cleavage uh, releases uh, this fluorescent fluorophore, so we excite uh, the, the solution at a certain wavelength, and then the, the, yes, so the, the fluorophore re-emits at another wavelength, which we are able to detect, of course. This is the basic principle. Then we, what we get is this kind of data. So we, we must be able to convert from fluorescence intensity, of course, to product concentrations. I'm going to uh, tell you something about it uh, soon. And then we get this kind of data series. So I, I would like to stress that we try to um, Mm, simultaneously fit in the end several data series that are, you can see different colors with the error bars in which you have different concentrations. And we let also, of course, crowded concentration vary. Then we, uh, we describe the, uh, let's say, the, the reaction with the chemical reaction network. We get a, a system of differential equations. So can, of course, we can integrate them and we get the theoretical estimations that you find here in black that are uh, optimized through a, uh, an algorithm, and later uh, I'm going to tell you something more. And um, so uh, through this, we can uh, characterize enzymatic reaction models and read the crowding effects. So this is the pipeline of uh, the work. Now I would like to focus on, uh, on this uh, first part. So the point is that this kind of experiment, uh, the, the, what I'm telling you about, is, was performed in Centro de Biophysique Moleculaire in Orléans, where I was uh, during my first year of PhD by my colleague uh, biologist. And the point is that often people in this field uh, assume uh, some kind of uh, linear dependence, uh, which is true in, a, in the dilute regime um, between fluorophore concentration and uh, fluorescence you detect. This is something that is uh, quite easily motivated, the relation that you can see. One just integrates uh, the, what is known as relative transfer equation, what uh, gives rise to beer law at the lambda excitation and the emission wavelength. And you get this kind of behavior. Therefore, you have a dilute regime in which you have perfect uh, proportionality, and then, for, and then you have a saturation value. But in our case, we are interested in uh, a more uh, a complicated situation in which you have a lot of species that can be, in principle, uh, uh, optically active at the wavelengths uh, of interest. And therefore, uh, we simply uh, decided to use this relation that is uh, that you can find integrating radiative transfer equation in the same setting. And what you get is that you don't have just uh, a single saturation value. You have, uh, you have uh, that the saturation values depend on a ratio and a competition between a source term and an absorbance term. Uh, as you can see here, an application in, uh, in, a, in a calibration, uh, in a certain calibration uh, case. And as you can see, this has uh, an effect both on the saturation values, but also on the slopes that you have at the beginning. And this is, of course, fundamental when one wants to really uh, compare the results of experiments with 
significantly different absorbance conditions, which is the case of crowded, the crowded systems we consider. And uh, I would like also to mention that this relation in a quite compact way accounts for quenching mechanisms, either collisional or uh, static, and also what in the literature is known as uh, inner filter effects. And so uh, moving on to what is uh, uh, the main uh, part uh, is the application to the, the kinetic experiment with human neutrophil elastase, the substrate I showed you, and the three crowder species that I mentioned. So human neutrophil elastase is a serine protease like remotipsrin that is uh, uh, better known typically. And so the, the mechanism through which it is known to work is a, a three steps mechanism. It is known to form a complex. Then uh, a first product is released that is the fluorescent one in our case. And then you have still a complex in the solution. And just after release of a second product, the enzyme is again freed in solution. So, I get the chance also to mention a bit how we work. Therefore, we, uh, what we typically do is interpret the chemical reaction network as a set of, uh, as a dynamical system. And uh, then say that the, dynamical, the solutions of the dynamical systems are completely described in the end by a set of uh, kinetic constants. And then one can optimize the set of kinetic, co the, the value of the kinetic constants, uh, reaching the best fit with an optimization algorithm. And there is what we get, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the, one of the best fits that we have for, for this case with, the, with this model, and uh, which is good, but not so good, especially when one moves to crowded condition. Therefore, we studied also the possibility of introducing other models. And uh, let's say that this kind of model that you see here can be also uh, seen and imagined as, a, as this kind of triangle in which you have the three uh, enzymatic states, okay, uh, the, the, the free enzyme and the true complexes. The idea is that there could be two conformations of the enzyme of different uh, uh, proficiencies. Therefore, one, one may be more active, one a little bit less, and that, that are connected in a thermodynamically consistent way. This gives rise to a lot of uh, uh, freedom, of course, in the, let's say, reaction velocities in the, in the amount of time uh, I stress that these reactions l uh, last around uh, two hours. It's, uh, not, it's not a very fast uh, reaction. And uh, so this had also some evidence in the literature. Uh, we had found uh, uh, that for a very similar substrate to the one we consider here, there was necessity of uh, hypothesizing a rate-limiting conformational step. And as you can see, uh, comparing the, the first the model that I showed you before, the two products one, three steps, and the one with uh, uh, this more complex model of two conformations, you can see that the agreement is uh, a lot better in the second case. And this uh, is also another very good aspect of the introduced this model is that it allows us also to fit in a very satisfying way also uh, the kinetics in crowded conditions. Here you can see for the 10 kilodalton dextran, the case is in absence of crowders, 10% and 20%. And uh, as you can also notice quite clearly, um, the the, there is a, a clear increase in the uh, catalysis at the end of the reaction. So after two hours, there is clearly an, an increase in the, in, the, in the activity of, uh, of the enzyme. So um, this concludes the presentation. Of course, it, we have not uh, uh, yet uh, uh, connected what we found with uh, hypothesis about crowding. This is what we are doing now. We are modeling crowding effects. To summarize, uh, we have been able to develop an accurate fluorescence intensity measurement routine which allows us to quantify this kinetic experiment and enzymatic activity which reflect the uh, crowding effects. So as I mentioned, we are now uh, modeling them. And also in the future, we are going to um, perform experiments, uh, probably more interesting, with natural substrates. And the natural substrates such as elastin for elastase have a double role of it, both uh, substrate and crowder at the same time, which is, of course, uh, interesting. And so uh, I would like to conclude and thanking, first of all, uh, Professor Piazza, who is uh, uh, my supervisor in Florence and the coordinator of the XCrowd project, my other uh, supervisor in Orléans, Professor Amacek, and most of all, uh, Josip Atsetsic Vidos, who you see here, who is uh, uh, my colleague, B B PhD student, who actually perform the experiment that you, show, that you saw here. So uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention in the end.
Yes, actually, I think there could be several mechanisms to reach uh, such a condition. And uh, so f let's say that uh, in our data, both vary in the sizes and the, and the, um, and the concentrations, we have not reached uh, a critical size. But I think there are several, uh, among the different yeah, hypotheses that I mentioned at the beginning, I think there are several ways through which we could reach a, a critical concentration, yes. No, 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 I, maybe I, I, that I, I, I probably was not clear. So, no, no, the, so uh, you, you can see actually the effect you can see from the very beginning. Uh, the, basically, the, we, we actually noticed that it's really hard to um, somehow rescale the, the, these uh, curves one onto another. Therefore, the effect of crowding is, uh, is important since the beginning. The fact is that we were interested in fitting the data uh, and, uh, let's say, studying the kinetics over a long time, which is not typical of this kind of experiments. And therefore, actually, for uh, experimental reasons, we practically have the first data point after five, six minutes the reaction has started, which is really not typical of uh, enzymatic uh, kinetics. And, uh, but basically, we have uh, a very clear difference since the beginning to the end. The fact is that, unfortunately, this enzyme turns out to be uh, quite slow, and therefore we have not reached the really end of the reaction, therefore it's hard to derive conclusions on the asymptotic uh, behavior. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, last question while we do the transition. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is very important. So, uh, so basically, the, uh, there are, there are, uh, uh, there could be potentially 18. Then, the let's say the model is thermodynamically consistent, this gives to further constraints, we reduce to 15. But let's say that we are not very satisfied with this number. The point is that we tried several, let's say the starting point was that simpler model. We, we tested several hypotheses, we didn't find this, nothing, anything satisfying, therefore the idea was I just go to a, a, a kind of model that is somehow motivated in the literature but can give rise to a lot of different scenarios. Because that kind of model, if you think about it, can include the inhibitory mechanisms, uh, a lot of things. And therefore, let's say that it was uh, this, w this, this way, this also the mechanism through which we introduced it. But of course, there are 15 uh, parameters, which is not good. The idea is to try to reduce it uh, to a, a simpler one, actually. Great. Thanks for the talk and the session. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Ujjavadan, and I'm a graduate student, Professor Paul Selvin's group at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I'll be talking about kinase and motility using Menflux, specifically about back steps, rotations, and cargo size effects. So, a quick overview. Kinase and back steps show a clear ATP dependence. Uh, kinase and C terminus, or the head, dangles around, and kinase and angular motion can be quantified. So. The general idea behind these experiments is you have either a foot-labeled construct, as you see here, or a head-labeled construct, where you could label it on the C-terminus. Uh, you use an organic dye like LD655 or a, for the foot, or for the head you could use uh, quantum dots or NV40, so 40 nanometer nanodiamonds. And then you could stick it inside the MinFlux, which is one of the latest nanoscopes developed by Stefan Hell and his research group and you can track the location of the kinase in walking and then come to different biomechanical conclusions about its motility. So, the general idea is this. Kinesin can take different kinds of steps. So it could take a full half step, uh, which is a small limp in the process of full stepping. And if you look at the blue arrows, it could take a negative step, which you'll call back steps here. Now, there's also gonna be a hidden step where the unlabeled foot takes a step. But to observe what the hidden step does, we could label the C-terminus or the head and see what it does, or so we thought. We get funny results when we label the head, but we'll explain this later. So with the foot-labeled experiments, what we notice is that there's a clear ATP dependence for kinase in backstepping. So with, with decreasing ATP, you see an increasing percentage of backsteps. Now you see the same trend for the head-labeled uh, constructs, 
But what you notice here is that a proportionately greater percentage of back steps, and we'll see, we'll explain why shortly. So when we look at the back steps in relation to the half steps and the full steps, what we notice is that the back steps eat into the half step and full step percentages, and that there's no ATP dependence on the full steps and the half steps. When we quantify the full steps and half steps in relation to the track statistics, what we notice is that a minority of the tracks account for a majority of the half steps. That suggests that kinesins half steps are the natural phenomenon during stepping. We also then decided to quantify the consecutive steps uh, using a bivariate analysis. And we, and we approached this by quantifying the full step, full step, half step, full step, and the negative step, back up, forward step, and forward step, negative step combinations. And what we notice here is, look at these black segments. So the positive back step, positive step, and positive step, back step combinations are a majority relative to the green bars here. So the back step, back step combinations. What this suggests is that kinesins back steps are in fact sandwiched in between forward steps and that consecutive back steps are a rarity. What this suggests is that kinesins forward step after the ATP hydrolysis cycle could detach from the forward tubulin binding site. So we also decided to look at the traces of the head labeled constructs. So if you look at the quantum dot on the head labeled construct, you're gonna see these sinusoidal-like patterns forming and that accounting for a majority of your back steps despite the kinesin itself engaging in net forward motion. For the larger probe, so the 40 nanometer nanodiamond, you still see those same normal stepping behaviors but you don't see the sinusoidal-like variation. This points to a potential size effect. So Stefan Hell's group in a recent preprint proposed that kinesin's head might dangle, but our results actually confirm this proposal. So you see uh, with the head dangling and the circular motion, kine uh, Minflux's detector would detect that angular motion when the probe is labeled. So that what, that's what corresponds to the sinusoidal motion. What you see here is that because the probe is interacting with the microtubule and the probe is large and heavy, you're not gonna see those same interactions, so those same sinusoidal-like patterns. Instead, you're gonna see normal stepping behavior. Finally, we can quantify kinesin's angular motion by looking at these loops and calculating the continuous angular displacement. When you do that, take a look at these kinks that look like the stock market on a bad day. That corresponds to an angular rotation direction switch. These flat regions correspond to potential interim stepping regions. We need to correlate that with the forward stepping region. So the, for, the linear motion is disconnected from the angular motion. That's the big takeaway from this. But also you generally see tracks like this for the continuous angular displacement, confirming previous observations in literature that kinesins, that kinesin engages in symmetric angular rotations. Finally, in conclusion, kinesins back steps have an ATP dependence and you shouldn't be labeling the head if you want to make biomechanical inferences. Kinesin's head dangles and kinesin's angular motion can be quantified. I would like to thank my group for all their support as well as our collaborators and funding sources and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. If you hit, so I'm guessing you're asking along the lines of an optical trap. Yeah. So if you fix the head, this is uh, this is actually one of this is actually one of the concerns we had because with optical traps, I've looked at some of the past backstepping studies, and uh, I'm not sure if it would accurately accurately ref <laughs> I've seen past studies with optical traps where you see more instances of backstepping where there's a there's a certain bias towards backstepping. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why we decided to take this approach without fixing the head, just look at but kinesin even itself. Even if you don't have the head twist, the rotation of the corridor makes a difference. <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. The rotation of the corridor, even if the corridor is not fixed or the head label in your case, yes. it makes a difference on the, uh, on both the forward and the back of the We can stop here. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the talk and discussion. Very good talk. Our next speaker is Sohit Mehlani. All right. Thank you. All right.
Today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about mini proteins. So what are mini proteins? As you can tell, they're very small proteins, less than 50 amino acids. Their genes are usually just next to other genes or kind of overlapping them. They're not kind of normal genes. They don't always get transcribed. They only get transcribed in certain scenarios. Um, and they do get translated as well, which is something we only got to know in the last 10 years, that in fact these RNAs do make it to the ribosome. But it's been really hard to actually detect these proteins, primarily because our experimental techniques aren't specific enough to detect these smaller proteins, and we haven't been able to purify their structures as well. And one of the biggest problems with them is their unprotected hydrophobic cores. So a lot of them have these hydrophobic amino acids that you just cannot protect because it's so, such a small protein. You can do that in a longer protein because they can just fold in a way that hydrophobic residues can hide. You just can't do that in a smaller protein. So they tend to aggregate very quickly. And it's very hard to even understand or study their function in vitro uh, because they're just not soluble. But nature always has a way to you know, make lemonade out of lemons. So what nature does is only induces these mini proteins when there's a stress response. They're very quick and they quickly go out to the cell membrane and block it because they're hydrophobic. They wanna run away from the water. And it allows for inducing quick cell death, which can be very, very helpful if your cell is trying to prevent the spread of a disease. But we've only seen them in these disordered mini proteins. We have been able to synthesize ordered mini proteins in the labs and we've been able to make them soluble with this very specific structure that can hide the hydrophobic residues. But their function is still very much unknown. We, we don't quite really understand what they're, what they're doing and if they even exist out in nature. And one of the things we always love to ask when we're talking about protein function is, if they phase separate and how they phase separate. Now for those of you who don't know phase separation, it's simply proteins coming together, interacting to form a complex that's functionally active. So this complex can go around the cell and do things quickly and efficiently and with a lot of accuracy. So phase separation is very, very critical for protein function. And so the way we actually try and simulate a, pro, a phase separation for a protein like this is we take a 27 site polymer and we fold it on a simple cubic lattice. It folds into a nice three by three by three cube. The sequence has been optimized for the lowest possible energy in this compact native state. We take simple bond energy, simple functions, and we have MCMC steps where you can accept each move or reject each move with the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. And Surprisingly, it does form a disordered condensate. Now the important uh, detail here is that it's at, the it's at a temperature where a well-folded ensemble of this protein already exists. So this protein on its own at this temperature does not want to unfold. It stays in its own nice compact native state. But the moment you put two of them together or multiple of them together, they start unfolding each other and form a disordered, disordered condensate. And as you can see, the, the number of as the number of polymers in the simulation increases, the stability also increases. So you're looking at the average total energy per polymer on the y-axis, and as the number of polymers increase, the, uh, the total negative energy also increases, which means this condensate is making each polymer even more stable than what it was in its compact native state. And so that was kind of a surprising result uh, that we usually don't see in ordered proteins. And what could this really mean? Well, it could, it could mean two things. One is that we just haven't seen them yet. They're hard to identify. And maybe newer experimental techniques will help us see them. And the other is that they might have actually undergone negative selection. Uh, such ordered proteins with such unregulated phase separation might not be the nicest thing that nature would like because they're uncontrollable. And nature doesn't like uncontrollable things. So perhaps it's gotten negative, negatively selected. And I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my advisors, my lab members, and the organizers, uh, organizers of this conference and the sources that have funded me. Thank you. What do you mean? So it's like if I increase the number of polymers and at some point it start, starts being unstable? 
Um, no, we don't see that. So eventually it saturates. So you're seeing it at 20, it goes up to 40, and then it's like the amount of increase you get per adding more and more polymers is just little, eventually just plateaus. But it doesn't go back. It doesn't become more unstable. Sorry, could you say that again? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I mean, the, you just have the delta E for each step, and then, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. You want the PowerPoint? Uh, PowerPoint, yes, thanks. Okay. Great. Um, thanks again. Uh, next speaker is Domenico Caudo. Sorry. Okay. So, good morning to everybody. My name is Domenico Caudo, and I'm a PhD student at Sapienza, University of Rome, and at the Italian Institute of Technology. And today, I want to talk to you about quantifying fluctuations at cell division by population level measurements. So we can schematically represent a cell proliferation cycle as divided into two phases, a growing phase where cell components are multiplied and a division phase where the same elements are split between the two daughter cells. And this process is highly stochastic. Many noises affect it, but in particular, we're interested at the noise in division and we want to reconstruct the properties of the partitioning distribution. This problem is interesting because uh, partitioning noise has been linked to cellular heterogeneity, to popular rejuvenation, and also to asymmetric cell division, which is when daughter cells have a distinct fate from their mother. The study follows a previous work of the group on liquid tumor cells, and we took the non-trivial step of working with solid tumor cells, which means cells in adhesion. And canonically, adhesion cells are followed through uh, proliferation by time lapse fluorescence microscopy, which allows for a deep reconstruction of the division process at the single cell level, but it started to obtain a great statistics with this experimental procedure. So we want to propose, propose a methodology that allows to bridge between the single cell level and the population level, um, trying to understand how the partitioning distribution affects the population dynamic. And we want to do it with, by our flow, set, flow cytometry, sorry, which Simone explained to you uh, the other day, which allows to acquire the um, fluorescence intensity of a single cell, but to acquire an entire population and to follow it through time. So what we did was to label with a fluorescent dye a specific component of the cell, in this case cytoplasm, and, to, and we follow the proliferation of the population through time by acquiring a point every 12 hours. Each data point is a fluorescence intensity distribution, which is a superimposition of multiple generations of dividing cells. And we could, we could reconstruct all the generation uh, by a, a Gaussian mixture model, which returns the mean and the variance of each generation. Then we, can, we could fit the behavior of the variances versus the generation uh, with an analytical expression that can be computed by assuming uh, the most general form of the partition distribution, which means no assumption on it. And the fitted parameter is the variance of the partition and distribution. And the results are um, resumed in this bar plot for different cell types and different experiments. And as you can see, they're quite robust. Then we wanted to validate the results obtained with canonical time-lapse fluorescence microscopy. So we repeated the same experiment, but, under, but following proliferation under a microscope. For each division, we created masks following the division process with which we could reconstruct the total fluorescence of the single cell and compute the, fraction of the, the partition fraction by comparing the daughter's fluorescence to the mother's fluorescence. But doing that for all the division that we could see in our data, we can then directly reconstruct the partition distribution and obtain the, its asymmetricity and variance by fitting it with the sum of two Gaussians. The obtained results are shown in the last three bar plots where uh, the comparison with, micros with the microscopy data are the darker one and flow cytometry are the lighter one. And so, to conclude, we show that an accurate determination of the partition function can be, uh, the partition noise, sorry, can be done by standard flow cytometry measurements and that our approach has the potential to be applied to different cell types and to give, you, and to give new insights into the mechanism of asymmetric cell division. With this, I want to thank all the people that participated in the work, to all of you for the attention, and to the organizer of the, of the conference for giving me this opportunity. Thank you all. Uh, 
it's true. Um, so there's kind of a problem when the cells are symmetric uh, with this uh, general uh, uh, model, uh, which kind of disappear if you, um, for example, consider a binomial distribution of the of the partitioning function, and that's because when like. In, in this case, if you, if you assume a binomial distribution, then the, the variance of the, of the partition should, should go to zero with the number of, um, of elements that you are labeling. So uh, if, you, if you add more specificities to the, to the distribution, then you can recover the exact result. Thank you. If there's any Thank you. question during the transition, we can accommodate that. Uh, otherwise, let's thank uh, the speaker again. <laughs> and then we have. The next talk will be by Michele Thank you. Okay. So, my name is Michele Di Pierro, and uh, my group is based in Boston and Northeastern University. And um, as an Italian abroad, I'd like to. Uh, say that I'm very happy to be here in Trieste for the first meeting, first Italian meeting of the IBOS network. Uh, so thank you all for making this happen. So after, after deliberation, I thought that I could not deliver well any explanation to a problem in five minutes. And I decided I would just spend the five minutes framing the problem because I think it's an important problem and there's no current answer and there's no answer available at the moment. And the, the problem is about the structural ensemble of genes. So we know now that genome architecture is a pervasive feature of life, and uh, chromosomes are folded in very specific ways that are dependent on organisms and tissues. In the past few years, uh, a lot of work has been done by us and by other groups uh, in uh, sort of explaining uh, the physics, the, genetic, the physical processes that fold chromosomes. However, what about genes? You know, genetic is it's all about genes, and uh, and we all know this. And experimentalists they are moving toward characterizing the structural ensemble of genes, and yet uh, theory is lagging behind in this case. Uh, genes are only Oops. Oh, no, I'm going. How do I go backward? Okay. So, genes are only a few kilobases, and the extreme can be two kilobases, which would be only uh, five or ten nucleosomes. And uh, on the other hand, it can go up to 100 nucleosomes or so. So, and these nucleosomes, they're all different. They carry post translational modification on their tails. The myo might not be a histon one uh, bound at the diet of the histons. The spacing is irregular. Linker DNA is typically around 50 uh, base pairs, or, but there's a high variability. Then there's binding of transcription factors, and then there's binding of other proteins. All of these uh, factors, they make up for a very heterogeneous uh, system. And, um, and so, how, how can we address this with theory? We don't know. Um, you could try to simulate this all out on, and then you're running two problems. The first problem is that your computer's not big enough, and the second problem is that your energy functions are good enough. So even if you could simulate it, it would be just a random number generated. And the second problem is that because of this heterogeneity, this is a diff uh, difficult system to coarse grain. The obvious choice would be to have nucleosomes on a, on a string, right? You know, beads on a string. But what is your monomer here? All these nucleosomes are all different. All these distances are all different. In fact, in a normal genome, you'll be, or a normal gene, you'll be likely to find two nucleosomes one alike. So, so these are some of the challenges. I mean, the two major challenges. And then there's other things that you want to require to your, from your model because to believe your results. The first is you want to represent, very, you want to represent in a decent way DNA mechanics. This is extremely complicated. 
because the molecule is complicated. It's not, it's not, it's not simple polymer. It's, it's more of a rigid molecule, which is subject to buckling. It's, uh, it has a response to twisting that is anisotropic. So if you twist in one way, respond in one way, in that way. If you twist the other way, completely different story. There's a strong coupling between bending and twisting, and twist relax into bends, and bending relax into twists. Um, then you need to represent, that have decent representation of nucleosome mechanics. Nucleosomes are springs, they're nonlinear, and then as a certain point, they crack, and they open one of the two arms. The myo might not be a histone one position here, changing completely the mechanics. The other thing that is important is that when you connect these nucleosomes with a sort of like rigid stick that are the 50 bases, uh, the 50 base pairs of DNA, while one base pair doesn't change very much the distance, the one base pair gives a 30 degree angle rotation. So only three base pairs orthogonal. Three again, one the opposite. So very strong dependence on the positioning of these nucleosomes. For all of these problems, there is there's several attempts to model, few, uh, but no satisfactory solution. Oh, I forgot this. This is the last uh, problem is you want to take care of uh, DNA binding products that might bend DNA uh, over nucleosome or histone fact um, transcription factors that might rigidify DNA. So this is the last one. But overall, these things, there's really no working solution at the moment. I mean, we are working on, and this is one of the attempts. It's in progress. And that's it. So this is my lab, uh, my collaborator at the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, around the world, the funding, and the advertising that we are always hiring, both in Boston and in Houston. And uh, that's it. Thank you. So the MAC adapter has disappeared. Does anyone have a MAC uh, HDMI adapter? Sorry for the delay, I will be very fast, so, <laughs> so everyone can have coffee. 
Um, so, uh, I'm Francesca and I work uh, at Humanitas University in Milan. I'm a postdoc in the lab of uh, applied physics and uh, biophysics and microfluidics. Um, so, today I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit of cell biology, uh, in particular immuno, uh, the, the immune uh, cells behavior, so no physics, no models. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, first of all, uh, when you uh, implant a biomedical device into the body, uh, what can happen is that you may have um, bacteria, um, uh, bacteria. You, you might have a formation of a biofilm that triggers the immune response, but also in general when you implant something that is not, uh, that's, that's not pertaining to your body, you have an immune reaction, immune response. And this involves several types of cells, so um, NK cell, leukocyte, neutrophil, and also macrophages which are the, uh, <laughs> the main characters of my research. So what happens when you have uh, an immune response? There is a first phase of uh, acute inflammation that lasts a few days when you have pro-inflammatory cells coming into the damaged area. And then um, uh, after they clear out the area from debris, uh, dead cells, and they fight inflammation, um, there are um, anti-inflammatory cells that come into the area. And so they are um, res responsible of the resolution and the repair of the uh, immune response. So they um, secrete collagen and they form the scar eventually. If it, this doesn't happen, or either the scar or they integrate the implant into the body. If this doesn't happen, you might have a chronic inflammation, so basically pro-inflammatory cells keep entering in the area and uh, the implant might get rejected. So um, how do cells behave? Not only macrophages, but all cells. So basically, um, cells sense their um, extracellular matrix and their cues, the cues coming from the extracellular matrix through a process known as mechanosensing. So basically, they translate mechanical signals into biochemical signals, and then they transduce these signals into a cellular response. And this cellular response is mediated by also by integrins, that they act both in cell-cell communication and cell extracellular matrix interaction. And basically, um, in research, they found, like previous research, found that these integrins, so these structures, are involved in the cell cell communication in uh, uh, macrophages polarization, because uh, macrophages are cells that can either polarize, as I uh, told you at the beginning, towards pro inflammatory uh, cells or towards anti inflammatory uh, macrophages. So, uh, integrins may act in, the, in cell polarization, in macrophages polarization, and also in their interaction with the extracellular matrix, they can have a role in adhesion and migration. So basically, previous researches found that biomaterials, because it influences the cell response and the cell interact with the biomaterials with integrins, um, these interactions may cause uh, um, changes in how macrophages secrete um, cytokines, so which cytokines they secrete, in which cells they are gonna recruit, and then in the cytoskeletal rearrangement, so how they react to this um, interaction. And this may influence the immune response fate, so in the end, are we gonna have chronic inflammation or not? So what I'm trying to do is like understanding what happens to macrophages so um, when they interact with a biomaterial. A modeling biomaterial surface with uh, wrinkled uh, patterns, wrink wrinkled substrates, and uh, um, we are creating in our lab this surface through buckling. So ba basically, you take a PDMS, a polymer substrate, and then you apply a strain stress, and then you uh, oxidize the surface. And when you release uh, the, um, the strain, there are spontaneous wrinkles arising. 
And what I'm doing is culturing cells onto this uh, substrate. And these are either uh, like pre, um, the preliminary experiments I did with immortalized cells, so cells that replicate uh, uh, at in infinitive. And then uh, now I'm working with the um, uh, macrophages derived from patients, healthy patients. What I found was that uh, actually the wrinkle substrates influence uh, immortalized cells, immortalized macrophages. So how? Uh, first of all, um, in a red here, like this red box is um, softer substrate and the green one, so this one in the bottom is, are um, stiffer substrates of different wavelengths. And basically, um, I found that the softer substrates uh, are associated with higher cells viability. So cells are more on this substrate. Um, but also, I found out that cells start to align uh, according to the wrinkle directions after a certain lambda critical, so after a certain web wavelength, that in my case was around 2.5 microns. Another nice thing was that we cultured cells for approximately 24 hours on these surfaces. You can see here flat 2.5 microns and 5 micron surfaces. And uh, cells actually uh, migrate towards the main wrinkle direction, but also the speed is influenced by, um, by the wrinkle. So uh, then I moved on to patient-derived macrophages to see whether this is also true. So uh, here a schema because um, basically what, what you do is you have these small cells here, um, yeah, this small here that are monocytes, so the precursor of macrophages. And then when they differentiate, they can differentiate in big ones, so M1, more M1-like macrophages, so inflammatory macrophages, or more elongated ones, which are mostly M2 macrophages. So I found that actually also uh, to patient-derived uh, macrophages, the surface influenced the viability of cells. And I found that on soft substrates, so around two, uh, two megapascal, on 2.5 micro uh, wrinkles, um, the viability is maximum. And also the shape is influenced by the wrinkles. So as you can see here, you have for uh, 0, 1.25 and 2.5 microns a more uh, elongated phenotype, while for bigger wavelengths you have a bit more um, circular shape. So again, Wrinkles do influence uh, human uh, monocyte-derived macrophages, viability and shape. Um, and then I move on, again, tracking uh, the movement of uh, macrophages onto these different uh, surfaces. And I found that, again, for this lambda critical of 2.5, there is maximum viability, uh, but also maximum speed. So it uh, uh, it seems that um, the more th there, there is a lambda for which cells can move uh, super fast compared to other cells. And why this is important? Because if you think about um, um, pro-inflammatory macrophages, their role is to run super fast on the area of inflammation, clear out, and ask for help uh, for other cells. Um, Instead, for M2 macrophages, they are one that secrete collagen, so they are one that are more steady. So it can be that uh, macrophages cultured onto a certain type of um, pattern, uh, the pattern promotes their specific behavior. So now what I'm trying to do, since in the literature is found that there is also a lambda critical for which uh, we, you have a partial adhesion of full adhesion. So basically on full adhesion, the cells adhere to both peaks and valleys. Um, I have some preliminary data showing that also in like uh, macrophages this happens. So basically we analyze the profile, uh, the intensity profile of uh, stained cells, so the green one is phylloidin peak. Um, and we found that 
again, for flat and 1.25 micron surfaces, you have addition mainly on peaks, so probably the partial addition. Instead, when you cross the threshold, the critical lambda, you have uh, addition on both peaks and valley. And again, why this is important? Because accordingly to how you adhere to a surface, or how macrophages adhere to a surface, you can change also the way you move. So either swimming, so either you push the surface or you pull. And this is influenced the, the speed and also the behavior of macrophages. And so with this, uh, coffee is very close, I'm, I'm done. And I would like to thank my lab, uh, especially uh, the, the other postdoc of my lab, who's helping me a lot. And uh, if you have questions, please ask. No. Um, so you ask me whether I have chemoattractants so the cells move, right? No. So basically what I do uh, experimentally is then when I extract cells, so monocyte from uh, patients, I just give them um, um, a factor, a macrophages colony stimulating factor, so they eventually will become macrophages, but the movement they do is without any sort of attractant. So I just put cells into the well plate and I put into the microscope, we have a nice setup, so incubator and a live setup. And so they move, to just move, without any cue from the outside, they move, they move accordingly just to the pattern. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, more chaotic. So if you can. Oh. Wait. So. No, Papa. Um, here is like random in every direction, but when you have a pattern, they follow the pattern. Um, well, so wh why they shouldn't go in any direction? Yeah, well, actually, uh, cells are attracted to themselves, so they tend to form clusters. So eventually, yeah, they move randomly, but they search for pair, like for friends. But eventually, we can talk later. Uh, so <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>